Uh, got her PhD in Chicago in 2014 from Benson Park, and the dissertation topic was FIW modules and stability criteria for representations of the classical vinyl group. And since after that, uh, Jenny moved to Stanford, where she's a Zado assistant professor, and uh, her work on representation stability went in several directions, one of which she's going to tell us about today. Um, but just before we begin, um, so technically this is a GDD gear seminar, so we have to follow the procedures of the <laughs> seminar. <laughs> so uh, we can't start the talk unless we do it officially. <laughs> so uh, today's talk is by Jenny Wilson, Stability in the Homology of Configuration Spaces. All yours. What a wonderful tradition. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here to talk today. Um, so before I, uh, before I begin to talk about this project on configuration spaces, I, uh, I thought I'd give a little bit of background on the general framework of, uh, that I'm interested in in my research. So the very broad setup is sort of the following. I, I'm interested in situations where I have some sort of nice family of groups they come with inclusions. So examples might be the family of symmetric groups, the family of uh, general linear groups, the family of symplectic groups, maybe these same groups with different coefficients. So nice, nice groups that come in a nice family such as these. Um, and, and additionally, a uh, sequence of representations of these groups so a sequence of R modules, where in most cases, the coefficients R are going to be either the integers or the rational numbers. So a sequence of R modules, V0, V1, V2, et cetera, so that the nth term in this sequence comes with an action of my nth group uh, in such a way that these inclusions are uh, Equivariant. Okay, and and so then the goal is to prove stability results for these sequences of representations. The goal is uh, broadly falls under this umbrella term representation stability. And um, what this means differs a little bit depending on the context. So the sort of things that we might be interested in proving about a sequence of representations like this could be some of the following. So a simple question we might ask uh, is just to bound the growth of the ranks of the terms in this sequence. I, if we're working in a situation where uh, the, the representations are semi-simple, then we could ask for things like constraints on the irreducible representations that occur, or constraints on the characters of the sequence of representations. And it turns out, in some cases, you can place quite strong constraints on these things. Um, we could ask for some sort of finite generation or finite presentation type result for these sequences with respect to these actions. Um, and you can ask for things like maybe, uh, you could ask for, uh, let's say, recursive presentations for the terms Vn in the sequence um, in terms of the earlier terms in the sequence in a range. So these are all examples of the sort of stability properties that we might be interested in proving about one of these sequences of representations. And in all cases, the key to approaching these problems is the following, so the, the key is to realize the sequence 
as uh, a module over some combinatorial category over a category that is defined in such a way that it encodes both the actions of these groups and the maps between these, uh, the different uh, terms in the sequence. So a category that encodes the group actions and the maps. Okay, and so having, having done this, having realized the sequence as a module over one of these categories, we're now in a context where we can sort of do commutative algebra. And we can draw on tools from different areas. We can use tools from homological algebra, from algebraic combinatorics, algebraic topology, uh, in order to leverage finiteness results for this module structure in order to conclude these sorts of stability results for the sequence. So in very broad terms, this is the sort of question that I'm interested in in the research that I do. Okay. And the sort of applications, the, the particular things that uh, fall into this framework are things of the following sort. So some examples that I've looked at in this framework are um, the uh, homology or co-homology of families of groups or spaces like the following. So for example, you can look at uh, braid groups or generalizations of braid groups at um, hyperplane complements associated to reflection groups. Uh, you, I've looked at, um, for example, the Torelli groups associated to the mapping class groups and their analogs associated to automorphisms of free groups uh, at congruent subgroups of certain linear groups. Okay, at uh, generalized flag varieties. And the particular example that I'd like to talk about today are uh, configuration spaces of points in a manifold. So these are all examples of the sort of things that you can study using this general framework. All right, and so the topic for today, I'll focus on this project that's joint with Jeremy Miller on uh, configuration spaces. All right. OK. Uh, very good. So right, so the, the, the project for today is on the following objects. Um, so for in general, for M a topological space, we can make the following definition, the uh, ordered configuration space of M is defined to be uh, it's, I'll denote it by F sub K of M, and it's defined to be the space of ordered K tuples of distinct points in M. Okay, so this, by definition, this is the ordered configuration space of my topological space on K points. Uh, I can topologize this. It's a subspace of the K-fold Cartesian product, the subspace where no two coordinates coincide. And uh, for a given M, I can visualize points in this space as follows. So an element of my configuration space, if, if M is, say, this topological space, I can think of a, a point in my configuration space as a picture like the following, where I have K distinct labeled points. Okay. 
So uh, these configuration spaces, they come with a nice action of the symmetric group. The symmetric groups act by permuting the labels on the points. OK. And uh, this is a nice covering action. The quotient space are the unordered configuration spaces. OK, and so passing to this quotient is tantamount to just forgetting the labels on my points. And the quotient space is the space of unordered, just k element sets of points in the manifold. So these are the unordered configuration spaces. All right. The, uh, so for the purposes of this particular project, we uh, considered specifically the case when M is a manifold. And additionally, we assume that M is a connected, uh, sorry, so for today, we assume that M is a connected, non-compact manifold of finite type. So I assume it's homotopy equivalent to a finite CW complex. And of dimension at least two. All right, and in fact, the, the most interesting case of our main result is when the dimension is precisely two. So the most interesting case of the main result is when M is an open surface. All right, so we should picture something like this. And the goal of the project is to understand the homology of these configuration spaces. All right. OK, so uh, I guess there, there's sort of good news and bad news toward this goal. Some good news is that it is really quite easy to come up with examples of homology classes in these configuration spaces. Uh, in fact, I'll, let me draw you a picture of, some, of a homology class right now. So in this picture, here I have, this is a picture of a one parameter family of points in configuration space. And here is another picture of a one parameter family of points in my configuration space. And in fact, because these two loops don't intersect, I can sort of run both loops independently. And effectively, this is a picture of S1 cross S1. It's a picture of a map from a torus into my configuration space. So at least up to sign, this picture represents an element in degree two homology of my configuration space. So this, this represents uh, a class in H2 up to sign. And so in this way, I mean, I can sort of think of this picture here as this, this loop here comes from the homology of the underlying manifold. And this picture here somehow comes from the homology of configurations in Euclidean space. And so with those two starting points, we can produce lots and lots of classes in the homology of these configuration spaces. OK, so right, good news is it's easy to draw pictures like this one. Um, bad news is that, well, some immediate bad news is that it, it's hard to understand, for example, the relations between the classes we draw in pictures like this. Even the question of, is this homology class 0 or not, turns out to be fairly non-trivial. And in, in general, doing computations with these homology groups uh, is fairly difficult. So uh, there's certainly a lot of excellent work in that direction. Um, but we still, for example, 
don't know the Betty numbers for the configuration spaces in general for most manifolds. In fact, as far as I know, we know them for uh, Euclidean space or punctured Euclidean space. And I'm not aware of any other manifolds for which we know all the Betty numbers of all their configuration spaces. So these, are, uh, these computations are hard to do. All right, so that's, that's bad news. Ah, I guess toward the point of these being slightly difficult to analyze, uh, so this class that I've drawn here uh, is non-zero in homology. But if I deleted the point one, it turns out that this class, the remaining loop, is zero in first homology, which is particularly non-obvious because the same class is non-zero in, configurations, in uh, configuration space of, of just the plane. So, right, so these, these things are a little non-obvious. All right, so, right, so that's the bad news. But the, the good news is that these homology groups come with more structure. Uh, and so they, in fact, fit into the sort of framework that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, the key is that we can exploit both the actions of these symmetric groups and other structure coming from topological operations that I'll explain in a moment in order to sort of package together all of these homology groups of all of the different configuration spaces into an object that we can study in this sort of commutative algebraic context. So the key is to fix the manifold M and then view the sequence of all of the homology of all of its configuration spaces as a uh, single algebraic object. Uh, with extra structure that comes from both the symmetric group operations, uh, the symmetric group actions, and topological operations. Okay. No, I do not mean the cut product. I mean uh, something that I'll draw a picture of in just a moment. OK, so right, in order to define this extra structure, I need the following observation. So here's a fact uh, that comes from our assumption that M is an open manifold. It turns out, it's not so hard to check, that that implies that I can define an embedding from the disjoint union of M and uh, Euclidean space into M in such a way that uh, when I restrict this embedding just to M, the result is isotopic to the identity on M. So here's the picture we should have in mind. Here's my manifold M, and it has this self-embedding like this, that is isotopic to the identity. And then disjoint from that, I have this copy of Euclidean space. OK, so M is open, so I can define such an embedding. And since, since you say it's open, should we, we regard that circle at the end as the yes. Yeah. yes. Yes, yes, that's right. So there's no boundary here, exactly. The, this, it's a disk. Oh, 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 you have a circle that you actually put it in there. I see. That's right, that's right. So this is an embedding of R2 into this little collar okay. of the, the end of my manifold. OK, great. And so. Uh, Using this embedding, I will define some maps on these configuration spaces. And um, I would like to go through three different generations of stability results on configuration spaces. So the, the first generation 
is classical homological stability. Uh, so uh, these are results about the unordered configuration spaces. These are results that go back to the 1970s. And to define or to state these results, I need the following definition. The, uh, so I'm going to define a stabilization map, which I'll call T. This is a map from configurations on K points to configurations on K plus one point. And this map is defined as follows. I take a configuration uh, in my manifold. So it's unordered. Here's an unordered configuration of this manifold. And then I'm going to map this point in configuration space. Well, I map uh, this point to its image under my embedding. And then I'm going to introduce a new point in the copy of Euclidean space. OK, so, so here what we do is we map, we map the configuration to its image in, under, under um, this embedding map. And then we introduce a new point uh, in our copy of Euclidean space. OK, and it turns out that this defines a continuous map between the configuration spaces. So with this map, a result uh, from the 1970s uh, due first to McDuff, uh, and then it was made quantitative by Siegel, is that these unordered configuration spaces are homologically stable. So specifically, they showed that if you fix your manifold M and fix a homological degree I and look at the maps induced by the stabilization maps on degree I homology, then these induced maps are eventually isomorphisms. OK, so these maps are isomorphisms once k is at least twice the homological degree. OK, so this says, uh, at least speaking homologically, in a sense, this i-dimensional structure of my configuration spaces stabilizes as k increases. These degree i homology classes are coming from configurations on a relatively small number of points. So, great, this is homological stability. All right, so our project was on the ordered configuration spaces. And we could ask a question you can ask about the ordered configuration spaces is maybe something similar happens in that case. Maybe you also get some sort of stability as the number of points increase. Is it that they don't know what it stabilizes to and it still stabilizes or? Oh, uh, yeah. yes, so there are ways. In fact, I think the reason that they uh, were studying these spaces at the time is that you actually can make sense of the limit in this case. So these homology groups stabilize to the homology of, I think, uh, certain section spaces of compactly supported sections on uh, the fiber-wise one-point compactification of the tangent bundles to the manifold. And so they were interested in those spaces. And for that reason, we're led to study this, this homological stability phenomenon happening. 
Um, I think we, so I'm about to describe some stability results for the unordered configuration spaces. And I don't think in that case we know how to formulate any sort of analog of these sort of limiting spaces. But in the classical case, you can. All right. So the next generation of results are representation stability results. And so, right, we could ask about the sequence of ordered configuration spaces and ask if these spaces also satisfy some sort of homological stability. And the answer is, at least in the sense written there, they definitely do not. You can see that even in maybe the simplest case. So for example, if you look at the degree one homology of the configuration spaces of the plane, then this is a free group of rank k choose 2. So these, these ranks, these are growing polynomially. They're growing quadratically. So it has no hope of stabilizing in the sense over there. But let's see. But what's happening? So in, these, in this particular case, we can describe these homology groups. Um, where this comes from is that for every choice of two particles, i and j, I can construct a degree one homology class by letting the particle j orbit, let's say, counterclockwise around the particle i. And it turns out that for different pairs i and j, these classes are linearly independent. And in fact, this is exactly where these k choose 2 homology classes come from. And so, all right, so even though it's growing quadratically, uh, somehow these classes all look rather the same, kind of up to the action of the symmetric group permuting the particles. Okay, and that's sort of the philosophy behind this project, is that even though these don't stabilize these homology groups, there is a sense in which they do when we take into account some extra structure. Um, all right, so in order to state the next result, we need an analog of our stabilization map. So in this case as well, we can define a new stabilization map, stabilization. I'll call this one T prime. This is defined on the ordered configuration spaces. Okay. And this map is quite similar. So here, given some ordered configuration in my space, I will once again map it into its image under the embedding and then introduce a new particle labeled k plus 1 out in our copy of Euclidean space. All right, and once again, it turns out that this does define a continuous map between these ordered configuration spaces. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. And so back in around 2010, uh, work of um, Church and Church Ellenberg Barb showed the following. Okay, that once again, if we fix M, and in fact in their original 
uh, formulation, the, the result was just for the case where m is orientable. So we'll fix an orientable manifold m and homological degree i. Okay. And what they showed is that if you look at the image of the stabilization map, uh, the image of the homology under the stabilization map, well, it's no longer true that this is exactly isomorphic to the homology one degree up. Um, but what is true is that if you take its orbit under the action of the symmetric group, then you, in fact, do get all the homology of the next configuration space once k is large enough relative to the degree. OK? But, but it's not the induced representation, it's something like that? Um, ah, aha. So it is not precisely the induced representation. Um, but something close to that is true. I'll comment th on that in a second. So it, it is it, it, I, it is a pr very particular quotient of the induced representation. You can describe the sequence quite concretely in this case. I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. Um, but first, I want to make a couple comments. So one, one comment is that um, a nice feature of the methods we used in our project is that we could give a new proof of this result uh, that did not need that orientability assumption. So here's a new proof. There were some previous proofs uh, for non-orientable manifolds with rational coefficients. Um, here's, we, we gave a proof for uh, integer coefficients. So new proof without the orientability assumption And uh, let me give a very informal description of maybe how to think about this theorem. So uh, in rather imprecise terms, uh, this theorem says the following. It says that uh, once, as k grows, the ith homology of this k particle configuration space is spanned by classes that come from pictures like the following. So it's spanned by classes that come from pictures where I sort of have at most two i particles that are actually circulating around the manifold or around each other. And then the remaining k minus 2i particles are all sort of sitting static near the boundary. So there are somehow at most 2i particles moving around the manifold M or around each other. And the remaining K minus 2i particles are static out in that copy of Euclidean space. And so, this accounts for that growth that we see in these homology groups. So it's true that they all grow uh, like a polynomial of degree 2i. But, but that comes from the fact that uh, k choose 2i grows like a polynomial of degree 2i. And there are k choose 2i ways that I can select these k minus 2i particles. OK. So in a sense, again, up to the action of the symmetric group, these homology groups stabilize as k grows. Is that okay. basically a proof? Is that more or less a proof technique? This? 
Uh, no. Um, so the, the proof technique involves studying. We, uh, so in our project, we study uh, spectral sequences associated to certain semi-simplicial spaces that we can build out of the configuration spaces. And then somehow, by doing some analysis on the structure of these spectral sequences and running some induction, we can conclude some sort of finite generation result, some sort of vanishing of generators uh, with respect to the action of some category that's governing. Because you have no control over the generators of, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these modules, so there's no way you could argue uh, in some inductive way. Right, that's right, that's right. So once again, I, I know very, there, there are not very many examples where I can actually compute these homology groups. So we can't, we cannot conclude this sort of result using known computational results about the homology. I see, but for some special case of M, maybe one can actually give a direct control proof of this type. When M is Euclidean space or punctured Euclidean space, in those cases we understand the homology very well. And as far as I know, those are the only cases that we understand it well enough to actually compute the homology and then work from there. Uh, yes, very good. Um, all right, oh yeah, so I wanted to comment on the actual structure of these sequences. So it turns out the result that uh, Church, Ellenberg, and Farb proved, and, and the result that we proved is actually stronger than what I've stated on the board. So what I've stated here uh, effectively says that the sequence of homology groups is finitely generated with, the res with respect to the action of some category that's acting. Uh, and in fact, the, the full result states that in some strong sense, this sequence of homology groups is free as a module over this category. And so concretely what that means is that uh, it is actually possible to express this sequence of homology groups as um, induced representations of a very specific form uh, with respect to generators that are coming from degree uh, 2i and below. Okay, we don't know what those generators are, it's hard to do computations, but it does mean in a range, um, these, the, the structure of these homology groups is really quite constrained. So they are, they, are, uh, they are induced representations of a particular form. So let me write uh, this down. So in fact, the theorem is, is stronger than what I've stated. This sequence of homology groups um, is, is free in some sense as a module over some combinatorial category that is encoding these stabilization maps and the symmetric group actions. And so I'm going to uh, call the generators of these free modules uh, I'm going to informally call them the unstable homology groups. So these generators are gr subgroups of homology classes that are not coming from the image of the stabilization map. So I'll call these generators unstable homology groups. And that will feature in the next generation of results. All right, so the third generation of results is uh, secondary representation stability. And uh, this was the main goal of my project with Jeremy Miller. I should say this project, it was inspired by work that is uh, currently underway by um, Soren Galatius and Oscar Randall Williams and Sander Coopers, uh, they are studying in contexts where you have classical homological stability, contexts like the mapping class group and like linear groups, 
they're studying these secondary effects where you find some higher order relationships between certain unstable homology groups in the sequences. And uh, so that project that they're working on inspired us to ask the question about whether we can also find higher order stability among the unstable classes in these configuration spaces. Um, and I should comment, the, these two projects are, have proceeded by very different methods. So, so they have been working uh, with tools uh, called EN cells. And we have been studying these particular spectral sequences that arise from uh, semi-simplicial spaces called the arc resolutions associated to these configuration spaces. So uh, the methods are not the same, but they definitely uh, get credit for inspiring the question. And uh, in order to state uh, this third result, we need a third stabilization map. Okay, and, and this stabilization map is a little bit different from the earlier ones uh, in a few different ways. One way in that it differs is that this map is not defined on the level of the spaces. It's defined right on the homology groups. So this is a map that goes from the ith homology of configurations on k points to the ith plus one homology of configurations on k plus two points. So uh, another novel feature of this map is that, well, we're introducing not one but two particles, and we're actually relating homology groups in different degrees. So here is how this map is defined. So to define this map, I take my configuration on k points and map it to its image under my choice embedding. And then I introduce not one, but two points at infinity. And I introduce these two points in this one parameter orbiting family. Okay, so now instead of stabilizing by adding a point out near infinity, we're stabilizing by adding two orbiting points. Okay. Okay. And so the, the main theorem of this project is that we're going to get some sort of finiteness result with respect to this new operation of adding two orbiting points. So the main theorem uh, is the following. This is from last year. Uh, the statement is that uh, these sequences of, in fact, so for this result, the current result is rational. This is a result on the rational homology groups. And the result is that these rational homology groups has secondary representation stability. Okay. And so the result is if we fix i and we fix the manifold m, which again, uh, as always, is assumed to be a uh, connected non-compact finite type dimension at least two. And so the statement is that the sequence of unstable homology groups, so the sequence of these homology generators in the sense of the first theorem, in these diagonal 
sequences a rational homology, th this sequence is uh, it's finitely generated. up to uh, the action of the symmetric groups and these stabilization maps. OK. And so again, the, uh, the informal picture statement of the proof, or of the, of the statement, is that uh, there exists some stable range. We don't know the stable range yet. This is not a quantitative result. But there, um, well, for all, let me say for all i, there exists some stable range uh, so that these unstable homology elements are spanned by classes that look like the following. So they're spanned by classes where, again, I have at most r of i many points that are actually moving around the manifold. They're moving around each other. And then all of my remaining particles are paired up in these orbiting families close to infinity. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. T prime, is that what you want and not T tilde? Otherwise, I'm a little confused for T tilde. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I meant to write T tilde here. Thank you. I confused my maps. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, right. So there, here, here is an extremely important comment that I, I need to make right now, um, which is, so I said earlier that the most important case of this result is when the manifold is a surface. And the reason is, I really do truly mean this one-dimensional class where just the point k plus 1 orbits around the point k plus 2. And so this class, if my manifold has dimension 3 or more, this is actually 0 in homology. So if the manifold has dimension 3 or higher, then this stabilization map is, is also the 0 map. And so in that case, the main theorem is the statement that these unstable homology generators are vanishing in some range. So in higher dimensions, this, uh, this theorem is really the, the statement that primary representation stability occurs in a larger stable range. But in um, surfaces, uh, then this, this class we introduced may or may not be 0. And so this, this really is a true secondary phenomenon you get relating these, uh, these different classes, these different homology groups in different degrees. Uh, oh, right, so I was going to write down that uh, the unstable homology groups are spanned by classes that look like this, right, where um, all, uh, all but at most r of i many points are uh, in pairs, in orbiting pairs. in this copy of Euclidean space. OK, right. And so let me write down this remark. This remark, which is that when the dimension, when the dimension of m is greater than or equal to 3, this map is 0. So this map is 0 because it's the boundary of the class I get by letting point k plus 1 just run everywhere in a disk above the point 
k plus 2. OK, so uh, this map is 0. So the theorem implies an improved uh, rep stability range. And uh, in this improved rep stability range, this was, this was known to Churchill and Berg-Farb already in the case of orientable manifolds. OK, but in surfaces, the class may be non-zero. Uh, another remark I wanted to make is that this result depends on a Noetherianity result due to uh, Nag, Powell, Sam, and Snowden. So the, the theorem uses a Noetherianity result of Nag, Powell, Sam, and Snowden, um, they, they, they show that modules over the category that's sort of codifying the symmetric groups and the stabilizing by ordered pairs, uh, that those modules are Noetherian in the sense that submodules of finitely generated modules are themselves finitely generated. Um, and at present, this result is only known for rational modules. So uh, the, the machinery in our paper works uh, as well with integer coefficients. So if we could promote this Noetherianity result to an integer result, we could prove our result integrally. Uh, this seems very difficult to do, uh, but I'm an optimist. So hope that this will be possible. And uh, thank you. That was everything I wanted to say. Yeah. What's second level stability? <clears throat> I, was, uh, I expected you to say something like, if I understand the SN representation <coughs> given by HI of FKM, mm -hmm. then I can predict how to get the representation for the next uh, stage, right? Is that, is that a consequence of, of, the, of the theorem? Oh, right. So, uh, so let me make a few remarks. Uh, one is in the original work of Churchill and Berg Farb, uh, there, the sequences for fixed degree um, are modules over this category Fi. And so in that case, if you work rationally, then the, the, this finite generation result has very strong consequences for the structure of those symmetric group representations. And exactly as you say, if you know the decomposition at one level in the stable range, then you know it for every subsequent representation. You know what all the irreducibles are. That, that's true rationally. So um, integrally, we don't have results that are quite as strong. I mean, as there, there are more subtleties there to the representation theory of the symmetric group. Um, and in our case, so this is a rational result. So you could certainly ask, each of these has some decomposition into representations of the symmetric group that, in principle, we could understand. but. Um, the category acting here is sort of a much bigger and rather hairier category than Fi. And at present, we do not understand what the analogs of the stabilization, uh, th these stability results are. So I think, I think that's quite an interesting question. I think for the, um, somehow for the representable functors, then for the, for the quote free modules over this category, I think we do know how they decompose. But it's, uh, it's th these things are not free as right, modules. Back to M being just a plane and then try to predict some uh, general theorem of that sort? Oh, right. So when M is the plane, then this is free over whatever this category is. So in that case, we can tell you exactly how these but sequences evolved. In terms of predicting representations from other representations. Uh, That's right. Ah, but even in that case, somehow, so, so wait, I have a lot of questions about this. I do not understand it well. So we can, there are, you can compute the decompositions explicitly, but it's not clear how to formulate a rule of the sort, 
I give you the decomposition at level k, and you give me back the decomposition at level k plus 1. Where the boxes are added in the first case. Exactly, yeah. So it's not as simple as just adding boxes creatively to one level. And right, and so I think this is an interesting question. I would like to understand the combinatorics and the sort of representation theoretic combinatorial properties of these modules. And there's certainly something there, but I don't understand it very well. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, I think that in, in higher dimensions, there are some topological subtleties or something that maybe don't show up in dimension two. So I think the statements of the results will probably need a few more hypotheses on them in terms of the underlying manifold in higher dimensions. But um, granted that, I expect that, for example, you could ask about, well, instead of stabilizing by two points orbiting in this one parameter family, why not? introduce two points where one is moving in a sphere or a hypersphere around the other one. And it's certainly the case, if you look at configurations of Euclidean space, then you do get stability with respect to that sort of operation. So I, you know, it seems tempting to conjecture that this might also happen in other manifolds. Yeah, I think that might be true. And of course, you could ask about stabilizing with respect to any other homology class. So there's, there's a large family of questions you could ask for higher dimensional manifolds. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you.